Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and get started with the chapter seven leaves lecture. Okay, so th this is nice because it does have some new material, but here you guys are going to see that there's a lot of foundation that's been laid for this and it is a little bit uh, repetitive with the stems lecture because you're going to see that the layout of the vascular tissue is going to be really similar for both stems and leaves. And also, since you've been studying all of these tiny structures for quite a while, they're starting to become more familiar to you. So I hope that this chapter is a little bit more approachable. So let's go ahead and take a look. So the leaves are going to come from the leaf primordia. So if you guys remember when we did chapter four, we talked about the shoot apical meristem. Okay, so this is definitely something that could come up on the lab practical. The shoot apical meristem is going to be where the leaves originate from, and they start out as leaf primordia. So they're just like the little tiny beginnings of leaves that occur in the apical meristems and also the growing points at the axillary buds. Okay, the axillary buds and nodes we often refer to as being kind of like the same thing as well. Okay, so in general, leaves are going to have petioles. That's like the little stalk or the little stem that attaches the leaf to the main stem. So let me give you an example here. We have this little stalk that attaches our trifoliate leaf on the clo clover to the main stem. Okay, that length of stem there is actually part of the leaf and it's called the petiole. Okay, the actual leaf blade itself we refer to as the lamina. Okay, the lamina is kind of like the solar panel of the plant, right? The, the leaves are absorbing the energy from the sun. And the lamina is going to be the surface area that performs that function. Okay, the vascular bundles we can think of interchangeably as being the veins of the plant. That's where our dissolved substances are going to be uh, conducted. And then in many cases, you'll also have stipules at the base of the petiole. And those are just going to be little tiny leaf like structures that will help to uh, shield a developing bud. Okay, so in our flowering plants, we'll have the inner nodes, or we can also call these the leaf gaps, and those have the axillary buds at the base. So let me see here if I can show you an example, just to refresh your memory, and should have seen something like this in chapter four, but this will just help since we don't have any illustrations in this particular uh, slide. Okay, so if this is our main stem here, all right, then we'll have the area where the leaves emerge from. Okay, I'm kind of exaggerating it here a little bit so I can show the petiole as well. Okay, so here we have our petiole again. This is the lamina. Okay, and then at this little junction or this little, you know, crotch in the leaf here is where we would have our axillary bud. We could also call these maybe like the side shoots that haven't developed yet. Okay, we could also call these the nodes, All right? So this is like another little meristem that's hiding there. And in the case that this shoot or this leaf is taken off, say, maybe an herbivore comes along and eats it, then we're going to see the sprouting of the axillary buds. Okay, so these are essentially just little leaf buds that are at the nodes. Okay, so in this instance, I'm attempting to portray, this looks like a dicot, okay, and 
It also has alternate leaf arrangement. We'll get into a little more detail with that in just a moment. So similarly, we would have a little node here. These nodes may be so small, just like our shoot apical meristem, that we may not be able to recognize them or see them without close inspection of the plant. But here, I'm just drawing it a little bit exaggerated so we can all you know, see what I'm talking about. Okay, so this space in between here, that's in between the nodes, that length is going to be the internode. So if you want to kind of relate this back to, you know, from botany to horticulture and potentially how this actually applies to growing, then you can think about the fact that with a more compact plant structure, we're going to have a shorter inner node. Okay, so that could be either like a desirable compact uh, growing structure that I mentioned, or it could also be like a, a dwarf tree or a dwarf variety of a pea plant or something like that, where you'd have a really short internode, as opposed to an elongated internode, which would be associated with a stretchy plant, okay? Uh, that might be a stretchy plant that just happens to be a tree that grows exceptionally tall, like uh, maybe our Alianthus altissima, or maybe a plant that isn't getting quite enough light, so it's going to have a long internode, which isn't necessarily a good thing in that particular case. Okay, so we have the leaf gaps and we have the axle buds at the base. All right, so we can have either simple or compound leaves. The simple leaves just have a single blade. So a good example of a simple leaf would be like a citrus or a guava leaf. I'm also thinking of an oak tree, okay, with a, a simple leaf only having one leaflet. On the other hand, we can also have compound leaves. So let me go back to this illustration here because we have a few examples of different types of compound leaves. So the first one that comes to mind for a pinnately compound leaf to me is a tomato leaf. We also have an example here with a pinnately compound leaf in an acacia tree. Okay, so you can see that with the pinnately compound leaves, we have a subdivision of leaflets that happens right down the middle. So there's a certain symmetry that goes along with this, right? It's divided right down the middle. So instead of having you know, just one simple leaf here, we have many leaflets that are part of this pinnately compound leaf. Okay, this one happens to be even pinnate. As you can see, there's an even number of leaflets. Here at the end, we have um, two leaflets that are sticking out. So you guys may see something like this in the in a lab, and this will be a giveaway for you that it's even pinnate. And then the ash, you can see it pretty much has this same structure in the subdivision of the leaflets, but there's an odd number of them, and we have one little leaflet that's sticking out at the end. This example is from the ash tree. So in a lot of the legumes, like pea plants, will have trifoliate leaves. A good example of this would be for clover, but we also could see this in cowpea. And the name pretty much makes sense here. So you can see that at this same attachment point on the petiole, we have three leaflets. That's a trifoliate leaf. Okay, and then finally, we have a horse chestnut as our example for a palmate leaf. And as you can see, the palmate, palmately compound leaves somewhat resemble the shape of one's hand, right? Almost like we have you know, a palm with five fingers. Okay, in um, nature, we also see a bipinnately compound leaf. A good example of this that we have on campus would be the jacaranda. So if you look at this here on the top right, it resembles to an extent our pinnate compound leaf, right? Because we have this symmetrical subdivision going down the middle and we have two sets of 
of leaflets here, but actually in the bipinnately compound leaf, these are further subdivided into another set of leaflets. Okay, so on each one of these little stems, there's a set of leaflets that's separated in half as well. Okay, so this is also the bipinnately compound leaf is also common in the legumes or the Fabaceae. Those are gonna be plants that are in the pea family. And then here we have another example for palmately compound leaf um, down here on the lower right. Okay, so light energy is captured by the leaves. This takes place in the process of photosynthesis. So the light energy from the sun is trapped and stored in the leaves in the form of glucose, okay? And as we discussed earlier, that's gonna be the product of water and carbon dioxide. So the stomatal pores are located on the leaf surface and our monocots, which are especially the grasses, they're actually gonna have the stomatal pores on both surfaces of the leaf because there's not a clear upper and lower surface really on a grass, it's just a, a blade, okay? Uh, but specifically for the dicots, then we're going to see there's those tiny pores on the lower surfaces of the leaves. So these function for gas exchange. The plant is going to take in CO2 for carbon capture, and then oxygen is released. This is a trade-off, though, because the plant also is going to be giving up water when the stomata are open. You know, water can escape as a gas from these stomata pores. So there is a method of regulating water, water loss and the stomatal apparatus is made up of the guard cells. And this will kind of re resemble a pair of lips. I believe that we have a picture later on for that. Okay, there are also some other functions that leaves perform. So sometimes if there are uh, toxic compounds that are accumulating in the leaves, you'll see that those leaves will turn yellow, they'll begin to senesce, and then you'll have leaf drop. So this would be separate from uh, leaf drop in the fall, right? This would be just a method that the plant has to eliminate waste that have been accumulated. So as you guys remember, the vacuole is gonna be where those wastes are stored. Okay, and if the conditions are toxic, the plant can actually eliminate the waste by dropping leaves. Okay, we've talked about the way that water moves through the plant and how it is a passive process. Okay, one of the main ways that water is going to move is going to be by transpiration through the leaves. If we have a lower relative humidity outside of the plant versus within the leaf, then that's going to create a negative tension that will tend to draw the water out of the stomatal pores and back into the atmosphere as vapor. So without that force of that negative tension, then it, the water wouldn't be able to move up the plant at all. Okay, there's also the process of gutation, and this is gonna be where water is pushed out at the leaf tip through hydathodes. And I believe that we have an illustration for this one coming up as well in the future. Okay, so phyllotaxy, that refers to the ways that leaves can be arranged on a stem. So the most basal or the most ancient type is going to be the world leaves, which are shown here on the far right. And these are arranged kind of in a circular pattern. It reminds me of the way that the petals of a flower are arranged. Uh, as you can see, they actually are going to have three or more leaves for every node. Okay. Now the more derived phyllotaxy, or that is to say the more evolved phyllotaxy would be to have the opposite or alternate leaf arrangements. Okay, so the opposite shown here in the middle, we have two leaves per node. And you can see that they're actually coming out from the same growing point in opposite directions. 
hence the name. For alternate leaf arrangement, there's only one leaf emerging from each node. And another way that this is sometimes called is a spiral leaf arrangement. Here, the nodes are occurring on alternate sides of the stem, and they will continue to alternate as uh, the stem grows longer. So that's why it's called the alternate leaf arrangement. Okay, another way that we can describe the way that the foliage is arranged and the way that it appears on different plants is going to be by the venation. So over here on the far right, we have the palmate venation. And here you are going to have several primary veins. They're radiating out from the base. And just like our palmate uh, compound leaves, the palmate venation kind of resembles the palm of one's hand. For our pinnate venation, as you can see, it is symmetrical here. And we can see that we have one main midrib, and then we have some secondary veins that are branching out from there. Okay, for our monocots and dicots, we need to take note of some of the differences in the way that the venation is arranged. Okay, so just like we saw that in our stems, the vascular tissue is gonna be evenly distributed. That vascular tissue in the stems was actually running parallel as well. And we see the same thing in the leaves here. The leaves of monocots have parallel venation. So we can perhaps observe this in grasses and we can also see in other monocots, I'm thinking about palm trees, how they have that parallel leaf venation. That's typical of monocots. On the other hand, the dicots, as you can see an example up here in the middle, they have branched venation. Another way to phrase that would be to say they have netted or reticulate venation. And as you can see, these leaf veins are going off in various directions, definitely not parallel like our monocots. Now, on the other hand, our more basal variation here is going to be the dichotomous venation. The only plant where we're gonna see this dichotomous venation is gonna be in ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba is an ancient plant and it's a conifer, okay? And sometimes people will get confused between the parallel venation and the dichotomous venation. But the difference here is that we actually see that the venation in the dichotomous plant is going to branch, right? So it forks into two different directions. That's why it's called dichotomous. Okay. So let's go ahead and look in a little bit more detail at the three main regions of the plant. The epidermis, first of all, that's kind of like with us, how we have skin on the outside. The epidermis is going to cover the entire leaf surface. It's typically going to be a single layer of cells. It's not photosynthetic and it's coated with a waxy substance called cutin. The purpose of the waxy cuticle is going to be to prevent water loss from the plant. And the epidermis is going to protect the tissues inside the leaves as well. Uh, sometimes we're also going to have glands like our glandular trichomes that are going to carry our um, oils and aromatic substances. Sometimes we'll also have alkaloids or toxins. Okay, those are part of the epidermis. Okay, next let's look at the stomata. So in our dicots, we'll have a thinner layer of cutin. And then that's where we're going to see the stomatal pores. Okay, the stomata consists of the two guard cells. And their purpose is going to be to control the gas exchange between the atmosphere and the inside of the leaf. So in other words, they're going to control how much water evaporates from the plant. So if these stomatal pores inflate, that's going to open the stomata. If they deflate, 
then the stomata will collapse. In that case, that pore is going to be closed. Okay, let's take a look at this illustration. So as you can see here, the stomatal guard cells are photosynthetic. You can see that they have chloroplasts in there, right? And they're also alive at maturity. We can tell that they have a nucleus. The stoma itself, that's the opening. We say stoma for a single opening or stomata would be plural, talking about a number of pores on the underside of the leaf. Okay, the inner cell wall, as you can see on the guard cell, is thickened. Okay, and then these are going to be just surrounded by all of the epidermal cells. So if you guys look at this under the microscope, the epidermal cells kind of look like a bunch of puzzle pieces that fit together. And then these guard cells, they kind of resemble a pair of lips. Okay, so the mesophyll is going to be the site of most of the photosynthetic activity in the plant. And this is made up of the palisade mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll. So you can see an example of the palisade mesophyll here. It's in the top half of the leaf, if you will. And you can see how you have these numerous tightly stacked uh, parenchyma cells and they're full of chloroplasts. These are going to actually have the highest density of chloroplasts in the whole leaf. On the other hand, the spongy mesophyll, just like it sounds, it's kind of spongy because it has a lot of air spaces. Okay, it's going to have a lower density of chloroplasts in that case. Okay, and here's an example of what it really looks like under the microscope. So we can see our single layer of upper epidermal cells here. Underneath that is the palisade mesophyll. This is a really good example because we have our two layers of these barrel-shaped palisade parenchyma. And in this case, the cells look red instead of green because of the stain, but you can see there's lots of chloroplasts inside of these. And then the spongy mesophyll has abundant air spaces in between them. So you can see these air spaces are just negative space in there. Okay, you can see the vein or the vascular tissue as well. Then we have on the lower surface, the lower epidermis. In this instance, true to form, the lower epidermis is a little bit thinner than the upper, upper epidermis. And then we can just see a little stomatal pore here on the bottom if we look closely. Okay. So there are some important differences that relate to monocots, which grasses are our typical monocots. And as you can see here, we have lots of photosynthetic parenchyma. I guess those cells in this stained version look blue, okay? But they're not differentiated into the two layers of palisade and spongy. It's pretty much uniform. Remember, I also mentioned that they're typically going to have the stomatal pores for gas exchange located on both of the leaf surfaces. The other cool thing about grasses is that they have bulliform cells. So in this example, we have a corn leaf. A corn leaf is fairly large in terms of the amount of leaf surface that it has. And these bulliform cells under conditions of heat stress are going to collapse and the leaf is actually gonna roll. This will protect the plant. It's effectively going to reduce the leaf surface that um, is available for water to transpire from, and it helps the plant to get through heat stress. So often you'll see that at midday, say if you're growing corn during the summer, these bulliform cells will activate, you'll see the leaf roll, and then in the morning when you come out, you'll see that the leaves have recovered and they've unrolled and look more normal. Okay, you guys also need to be aware of the differences between sun and shade leaves. And you do have an example of this in your book as well. Okay, so this relates back to our third discussion question when I asked, you know, how can the sun or how can UV light in general 
damage biological molecules. So, you know, one of the reasons why the sun leaves, and this top right example here is an example of a sun leaf, okay? Why they have these double stacked palisade mesophyll parenchyma, it's to harvest as much light as possible, right? Because there's more opportunity to harvest light in the sun. Uh, but also it is for photo protection. So in full sun, the plant really needs this double reinforced stack of the chloroplast to um, just protect the plant from UV as well as harvest light for energy. Okay, so here in this, this sun leaf, we have this clear differentiation of the palisade mesophyll. It's pretty thick. And then the spongy mesophyll. Overall, the sun leaves are going to typically be thicker, okay? Um, remember, they'll probably also have a thicker cuticle to protect them from water loss as well. The shade leaves are going to tend to be larger, so they'll have a greater surface area of, that's like a bigger solar panel, allowing them to harvest more light. And they'll also be thinner they don't need as many chloroplasts for photo protection. It's more economical in that case to spread those chloroplasts over a greater surface area and to have a thinner leaf. As you can see, there's also quite a bit of airspace in this shade leaf down on the bottom. The spongy mesophyll is just as thick as the palisade mesophyll in the shade leaf. Okay, also something you should be aware of is that the the trichomes and hairs that I mentioned that may carry um, toxins or aromatic oils, they can also be another layer of photoprotection. So if you have plants that appear like a, a grayish green, often it's because they're covered by tiny hairs and these tiny hairs actually are gonna block out some of the light. So for that reason, the shade leaves tend to have fewer hairs. Okay, so next, this is where it starts to get a little more exciting, I think, where we're looking at specialized leaves. And let's first look at the leaves of arid regions. So this would be especially dry regions. Uh, we can think about the desert. We can think about Southern California in general. There are some specializations that the leaves of arid regions have. So the leaves will tend to be thicker. Um, we, they will tend to have specialized cell for water retention. In some cases, they may even lack leaves altogether. So we'll take a look at a succulent leaf in the lab if we get a chance to take a look at the aloe leaves. And you guys can see these water retaining specialized parenchyma. And it makes sense also that they would tend to have fewer pores for gas exchange, or they may be slightly recessed on the surface of the leaf. Okay, and I've also mentioned the dense hairy coverings that are there for photo protection. Those are gonna be typical of drought tolerant plants and the leaves of arid regions. Okay, to the other extreme now, thinking about the leaves of aquatic areas. In aquatic areas, there's less concern about the availability of water, right? So they'll tend to have less vascular tissue. And similar to what we saw earlier with our monocots, the mesophyll isn't gonna be differentiated into palisade and spongy. We're for the most part going to have a lot of spongy parenchyma. And I think that you guys saw in chapter four, the arenchyma, and a really good example of an aquatic leaf with large air spaces is gonna be the water lily. Okay, another type of specialized leaf structure is a tendril. So th these are going to help vines to climb, okay? And the example that we have here is with the garden pea. Okay, so you may not have known this before, but a spine, is actually a modified leaf. So what's interesting about cacti, you might think that the flattened paddle shaped structure is actually the leaf of the cactus, 
but that is a, a cladoed. The actual leaves are the spine themselves. Okay, the cacti are going to have sclerified spines, kind of like you can see on this plant, although I don't think it's a cactus. <laughs> All right, so these are going to be lignified and the photosynthesis is actually going to happen in the cladodes or in specialized stems of cactus. Okay, so thorns, we need to differentiate here between thorns and prickles. So you can see an example of a woody plant on the right here that has thorns, and these are extensions of the stem. So they're actually, uh, they're coming from the node just like the leaves are, but they are um, actually gonna be sclerified and they will have a vascular connection to the stem. On the other hand, prickles are what roses have. So this can be kind of confusing because you may have heard the song lyric, every rose has its thorn. Well, that is not the case. Every rose has prickles if they have these outgrowths. This is actually part of the outer covering of the plant, right? It grows from the epidermis. So these can easily be scraped off as opposed to these thorns, which are actually part of the stem. Okay, in terms of succulent leaves, these are modified for water storage and the vacuole is going to be the structure within the cell that holds that extra water. Okay, you can also have fleshy leaves that are for storing starches or carbohydrates and we can see examples of that with our lily plants. Okay. Cool, here we have some examples of plants that are actually uh, meat eaters or predator predatory. So in this instance with the flower pot leaf, these are going to be um, grown in well leached areas like a boggy or swampy area where there's low nitrogen. So the plants aren't able to get nitrogen from the soil, but here they have a symbiotic relationship with ants that are going to carry in nitrogenous waste. So this could be like something that's protein rich, or it could be like a dung or something like that. And that's going to give media for the plant roots. Okay. So the flower pot plant is also called Dachidia. Okay. Another type of Succulent leaf from Africa. So here, this plant actually looks like it's above ground, but this whole plant would essentially be buried and then only the tips of the leaves would be showing typically. And these window leaves are translucent, so you can actually um, receive light or the plant can receive light within the leaves and still carry out photosynthetic functions. Okay, another type of specialized leaf is a reproductive leaf. Here we have an example of an air plant. And what's interesting is that along the leaf margin here, we have nodes. So not just at the leaf axils, but on reproductive leaves, we have nodes at the uh, leaf margins as well. Another good example of this would be the Kalanchoe plant. Kalanchoe is a succulent plant that will produce little babies along the leaf margins. That is the function of reproductive leaves. Next, let's take a look at floral bracts. So this is interesting because often what we will sometimes think is the petal of a flower is actually a floral bract, which is a specialized type of leaf. So in fact, the poinsettia plant lacks petals entirely, okay? We have these very tiny flowers in the middle that have uh, extra floral nectaries. So you can see like this little round or ovoid shape will produce a nectar. And then these red bracts are what we might commonly think of as being the petals, okay? Similarly with clary sage, these beautiful showy purple flowers, 
They actually have floral bracts rather than petals. The flowers within are quite small. Okay, now looking at some more of the predatory plants. So we have an example of the pitcher plant. It has these tubular leaves and insects can get trapped inside. And then the plant will use enzymes to digest them. Okay. And remember, these are going to grow in areas that are not uh, nitrogen rich, areas that are well leached, like a swampy or boggy area. Okay. Next, we have sundews. So each one of these hairs has this like globular sticky substance that can trap insects. And then within this fluid, they also have digestive enzymes. Oh, we can actually see maybe a couple of little flies that are trapped here, up here in the very top of the picture. Okay, you guys might have seen uh, Venus fly traps. Again, these are going to live in a swampy or boggy area like North or South Carolina. And these are going to snap shut in order to trap insects. And that's gonna provide nitrogen for the plant. So, well, typically that would be the function of the roots. We have several examples of specialized leaves that can uh, actually be somewhat predatory. Okay, another example of insect trapping leaves is gonna be from the bladder warts. This is an aquatic plant and it'll often flow in shallow water and the insects will crawl into these trap doors get stuck in the bladder and then be digested by the plant. Okay, so changing gears a little bit as we're getting close to the end, let's talk a little bit about senescent leaves or changes in leaf color, color during autumn, especially for our deciduous trees. Okay, so the chlorophylls are going to appear green. And then the carotenoids will appear yellow or orange. As I mentioned, these pigments are always present in the leaf, but it's not until the chlorophylls begin to break down that we can actually see the carotenoids. Okay, we might also see a red or purple anthocyanin or a red beta cyanin. Those are typically in the vacuole. Okay, so that can give us some more variation in the color. So the way that the leaves um, eventually drop is going to be by the breakdown of this abscission layer. Okay. And there is a particular enzyme that's involved in the breakdown of the cell wall, and that is cellulase. So I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Okay, so the cellulase enzyme is responsible for breaking down the cell walls. And you'll have the uh, separation layer that will form here. And then as that cell wall is broken down, you'll have the leaves actually drop or abscise. Okay, so there are a lot of ways that we can use leaves. So we've talked a little bit about landscaping and we don't wanna forget you know, how much energy we could save potentially if we have you know, shade trees that are say, for example, protecting the Southern exposure of our house or the building where we, where we live. But we can also perhaps just enjoy a shade tree and its beauty, okay? Any of our plants that we eat the vegetative parts are, like celery, we'll be looking at that in the lab later on. Um, we can also think about spices, which may also have some you know, other nutraceutical or potentially medicinal values to them. Leaves can be the sources of dyes, the sources of perfumes and uh, aromatic oils for aromatherapy. You, you guys are going to observe the 
fibers of agave and the love as well. These are really important for uh, reinforcing the plant, but they can also be useful to humans, like the hemp fibers, for example. Okay, uh, plant leaves can also be used for, for drugs. So they're giving us the example of tobacco for nicotine here. For beverages, okay, insecticides, <laughs> waxes, and also, oh, they do mention beauty here in terms of aesthetics like floral arrangements or gardens that we can enjoy. Um, for rote known, I'm not as familiar as that uh, with that one, but when they mention tobacco here, it does remind me of the fact that the uh, nicotinoids can be used as insecticides as well. Okay, guys, and we have a beautiful picture of autumn leaves to end on here. <laughs>